Okay. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us your grace that is sufficient, Lord. And remind us, Lord, that as we are uh, seeking to serve you, Lord, um, that you are concerned, Lord, with the conditions of our hearts, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord, to remember that and help us, Lord, to uh, as we uh, enter into this service today, Lord, that um, uh, you will answer the questions upon our hearts that you would draw us closer to you as a result. And again, Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, question uh, number one that I'm going to address uh, if the seven trumpets occur in the context of the altar of incense and the seven churches in the context of the candlesticks, where in Revelation shows the seven seals, where the seven seals occur? Now, I know I said this is a, a, a simple question, but wouldn't if you've never heard this before, you're be probably like, me. I've heard it before, what but it would be ask? simple for me if I had to try to answer yeah. it. So I'm just going to explain it this way. Um, yeah. In the book of Revelation, you have uh, a several series of sevens. There are the seven churches, there are the seven seals, and there are the seven trumpets. Um, the seven churches, which is from Revelation 1 through 3, um, unfold uh, from a scene in the sanctuary that is pointing to the seven-branch candlestick. The seven trumpets, and this is what this verse is asking, uh, the seven trumpets occur in Revelation, beginning in Revelation chapter 8, and they unfold uh, the introductory scene to these seven trumpets uh, is the altar of incense. So they're asking where, what is the, I believe they're asking what is the unfolding scene for the, Revela for the seven seals. Yeah. The seven seals are found beginning in Revelation chapter 4, and chapter 5, and they occur at the table of showbread. Um, that opening scene shows a candlestick, which is directly across from this, from this throne. And if you go back to the Old Testament sanctuary, you'll see that the thing that was on the opposite side of the candlestick in the sanctuary was a table of showbread, and thus the seven seals, which deal with the history of the Word of God, unfold at the altar, I'm, I'm sorry, at the table of showbread. And these sevens parallel one another. Mm -hmm. So first church, first seal, first trumpet, all the way through, one through seven, right? They all parallel. So uh, that is the kind of uh, overall view of, um, of the seven churches, seven trumpets, seven seals. And let me answer this one real quick. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this name right. Desiree. Spelled a little uh, uh, different from what Desiree. I was there. Desiree. Yeah. Desiree. But uh, the question is, uh, is there an Adventist Bible? And the answer is, no, there Absolutely is not an Adventist not. Bible or an Ellen White Bible. Mm -hmm. There is the Bible. There's the Bible. Um, and there's an Adventist devotional. There's an Adventist devotional. Um, in which a, a, uh, an author paraphrased the Bible mm -hmm. in his own words. Um, but we do not call that a Bible. It is not an additional Bible. Uh, it, is not a, it, it, it is not recognized as a Bible. It's not something I've ever read. Yeah. yeah. But I have recommended it to uh, new believer friends that, have not new believers, not a new believer, but um, a friend who just had a hard time um, just reading like the King James, like all of mm -hmm. these and vowels, just, you know, because it's more of a story form. And yeah. so she found it a little bit easier to read, but it definitely is not a Bible and it doesn't replace the Bible. Yeah. It can help you have a concept. Yeah. It's a devotional. It's a devotional. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a paraphrase. So, okay. Um, so, Two questions. You can go ahead, uh, or okay. should I do another one? Was is your? Uh, I can I can do. One. I can do another one very quickly. Okay, go ahead. All right. So this one is uh, on Daniel chapter five, and uh, another pretty simple question. Uh, the person says uh, in Daniel five verse twenty five, it says many many to kill you farson. Then in verse twenty eight, it explains it, but it says Perez, what happened to you farson? Very simple. 
Uh, Perez is a is the uh, singular form of the word Eupharsin. So it is the same word, just in a different form. Um, so when the text says, you, uh, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom, Tekel, you are weighed in the balance and found wanting, and then Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians, that is the, single, the singular form of the word Eupharsin. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and okay. you can go ahead and I'm okay. going to... So I have a mental health question here that says, how does mental health interact with the grieving process, particularly when grief begins to affect daily functioning? What are some ways individuals can support their own mental health and well-being while navigating through grief? That's a great question. Um, and we all, you know, we live in this world where we, where we all are going to experience uh, some grief because... Uh, this life is not guaranteed and we lose people. We lose parents, we lose spouses, unfortunately, and it is very uh, difficult uh, to deal with. And so the body, um, as far as the, how it affects your mental health, so the body translates grief as stress. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't know the difference between, um, okay, sh this person's just grieving, they just lost, you know, someone. Uh, but the body and the mind, I should say, you know, it just, it, it, it calculates that as stress. And so when we're stressed, we become anxious. So it can um, definitely um, cause anxiety. And then when we're stressed, it can cause um, depression. I mean, it can cause um, the symptoms of depression because we are, you know, we are, we're grieving longer than to be diagnosed with clinical depression, it, it, you have to have those symptoms for longer than two weeks, and they consider that major depressive disorder. So we grieve longer than two weeks, obviously, but it is, but grief is not depression. Grief is, you know, a situation that's going on. However, um, it is, I encourage everyone that is grieving a loved one, and maybe not even a loved one, something, a situation that's going on to talk to a mental health professional and specifically talking to a therapist uh, that specializes in grief to help you to be able to manage and to work through that. Grief shows up and looks different for every person. For myself, you know, I'm still, I lost my dad, what, three and a half years ago. I grieve that every day, but it's the way that I um, process, you know, the way that I deal with it mm -hmm. is I find happiness or is thinking about his memories or the funny times. And I talk about him often and say some of his funny jokes and do some of the things that we like to do together. Still, that makes me, that makes me feel better. So, but for other people, their, you know, grief might look different than that. Um, and it might cause them to go into um, a space of depression because of the grief or have extreme anxiety and working with a therapist can help you be able to process that because your body is just uh, taking it as stress and that stress hormone is going to cause a lot of different mental health issues yeah so okay. Was, okay you got another one or oh i i yeah but you go uh, ahead. yeah go ahead so i'm gonna answer a couple things real quick and then i'm gonna get to like because i'm gonna answer some things in the chat number one Someone asked, what about the Remnant Study Bible? Uh, the Remnant Study Bible is, is not an Adventist Bible. We don't have an Adventist Bible. The Remnant Study Bible is a Bible with study notes that are in it. So, you know, you might buy a Bible that has a commentary that goes along with it. It's the same thing. Uh, it is not a new Bible. It is a Bible with study notes. And... Um, uh, the Remnant Study Bible contains, um, you know, study notes from an Adventist perspective, but it is not a, it is not an Adventist Bible. Um, someone asked very quickly about 31 AD and the death of Christ. Why do different people think that, uh, uh, teach that the death of Christ happened in some say 29 AD, some say 32 AD? Uh, some say 30 AD, and you're asking the question probably because you're thinking about the 70-week prophecy and the 2300-year prophecy 
in which uh, Jesus is said to die in the midst of the week. Um, and basically, what, what I want you to understand is that it really doesn't matter if Jesus died in 31 AD or 30 AD or 29 AD or 32 AD, because the text says that the Messiah would die in the midst of the week. So whether it's a 31 date or 32, um, 31 AD date or 32 AD date or a 29 AD date does not do anything to the starting point and the finishing point of the prophecy, okay? The text simply says that he would die in the midst of the week, in the midst of the week. So, um, all right. So I just want to deal with those two questions very quickly. Mondo, I see you. Oh, um, Mondo. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mondo. Um, okay. So let's go to the next question. A couple of questions here that I'm going to do. You have to tell do. people who Mondo is. Yeah, Mondo is uh, the other former Boogie Monster. Yeah, he's uh, and uh, one of my best friends. Um, a funny, funny guy. And a funny, funny guy, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so next question uh, is, what happened? When did Jesus ascend to heaven? Was it at the end of his 40 days with the disciples, or was it before this? Um, So in John chapter 20, verse 17, you know, as Mary is, is, is seeing Jesus for the first time, uh, Jesus said to her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. So we believe that Jesus ascended to heaven at his resurrection and then came back. And when he saw Thomas, you know, Thomas, touch me, see that it's me. Mm -hmm. um, and then he spends the 40 days with the disciples and then he ascends to heaven again. So, um, yeah, we believe that he ascended on the day of his, uh, of his resurrection and then came back down and then spent the 40 days with his disciples. Um, another question very quickly. Uh, did Jesus die on Wednesday? to make three days and three nights, or did he die on Friday? So we believe that Jesus died on Friday and that the way that the Jews counted the days um, did not require a full 72 hours, meaning, uh, you know, the three days would have been Wednesday, Thursday, uh, or Thursday, Friday, Wednesday, okay. Thursday, Friday, and then he's resurrected on, uh, I should say, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then he's resurrected on the first day of the week. Um, so if you look at the, the three days and three nights, Friday afternoon would be w part of one day. Right. Friday night would be one night. Saturday would be the second day. Saturday night would be the second night. And then Sunday, the first day of the week, while, the Bible actually says while it was yet dark. And so it is not only the third day of the, it is not only the third day, but it is the dark part of the day, the night part of the day, if you will. That is how we get to three days and three nights without having to move Jesus back to being crucified on a, on a Thursday or a Wednesday. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll again pause here and. Okay. You can go ahead no with your question. questions. Yeah. I'm going to take one from the chat. It says. Um, can attachment styles impact your relationship with God? As an anxious, um, anxious avoidance, I feel my attachment style can make it difficult for me. Um, that's good awareness that you have because definitely attachment style um, can impact your relationship with God and in general with just your relationships with other people. So for those of you who are not familiar with attachment uh, styles, just want to briefly go over this. So the attachment styles, like you can have a secure attachment style. And before I say that, go into some of these attachment styles, let me just say that these attachment styles are developed uh, from your primary caregiver as a young child. And even when you're an infant, like if you don't didn't have a parent that was nurturing and loving when you're an infant and you know, the, 
the holding, the kissing, just nurturing. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to develop, uh, you're not going to develop a secure attachment, a style. You're going to develop a more than likely an insecure attachment style. So there's secure, there's insecure attachment style, there's anxious attachment sty style, there's avoidant attachment style, there's disorganized attachment style. So all of these play a role in our relationships, um, again, just with other people. And um, if you have like the insecure attachment style or the anxious attachment style um, or the avoidant attachment style, it definitely can impact your relationship with God because you're processing God through those the lens of those attachment styles. And if you don't have a secure attachment style, like let's just say you didn't have a loving father growing up, it's going to be difficult for you to see God. Not that it's impossible by any means. All mm -hmm. things are possible with God. It, it, they're, they're possible and not difficult. That's what we should yeah. always remember. That nothing's hard for God. And so, but you're going to process God through, you're going to see through the lens of an absent father or a non-nurturing father or a father that wasn't there for you. Um, and that could lead to an insecure um, attachment. Just not, it's hard to understand the character of God and how loving God is. Like you'll know it in theory, but the emotion behind that might be difficult. Mm -hmm. And so you might find that you know, you, your relationship with God is a challenging one just because of that, I say, faulty lens that you're viewing God through. And again, as I always say, you know who can help you work through that? A mental health professional. Ultimately, mm -hmm. God is mm -hmm. the best mental health therapist. Yeah. But, a, but here on this earth, a mental health professional can help you work through that. Um, and that can definitely improve your relationship with God. Yeah. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me see. Uh, all right, so I'm going to deal with a question here um, about a parable. Uh, and let me just read the question here. I know that Jesus did not commend the unjust steward in the parable, but he said that the master in the parable co commended the unjust steward. Uh, and then Jesus' remark was that the, the sons of the world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of life. What did Jesus mean by that? And uh, basically, she's asking, she's saying, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to understand this, uh, this parable. Um, let's see. So let me... Let me pull the. Were you Are gonna, you pulling it up? I yeah. just want to answer somebody's question in the chat really quick. Yeah, they go were ahead. like, um, yes, a book that I want to recommend to you. Um, actually, I, let's see if I have, okay, I don't have the name of the book, but if you, but it's Sue Johnson, so if you Google uh, Dr. Sue Johnson, she uh, um, is um, emotional focused therapy therapist, and that's, she, that's all she does, really, is attachment styles, and so even in uh, graduate school, we have to study her work uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with attachment styles, so just Google Sue Johnson and all of her material about attachment styles will come up and you can learn more about it. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to read the parable and then we are going to, uh, to, um, to mention this. Okay. So, or to, to break it down. So there was a certain rich man which had a steward and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me my, the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I'm ashamed. I'm resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses." So I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not going to read the rest of the parable here. He goes and he begins to uh, write off these debts that other people had owed. And let me just read that part. So he called every one of his, Lord, of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. And he's doing all this. Uh, and then he says, uh, let me go back. 
he says, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And then he says, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when you fail, you may receive, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Okay. So this sounds like a complicated and like, wait, this guy does something that's kind of like crazy. Why is the Lord, uh, the Lord in this parable? There's the rich man in this parable commending the unjust steward. Um, let's see. So basically, this is a parable that is speaking, Jesus is speaking to the Jews. And in this parable, he's, he's saying, listen, your stewardship is about to be taken away. Why? Because you're being unfaithful to that which I have given you. And in this parable, he's saying, look at, what the, look at what the man in the parable did when he knew that he was about to get put out. He went and made friends, right, with those that were in debt and helped them out mm -hmm. so that he would have a place to go when he stopped being a steward. Mm. So put a one in the chat if you're seeing where this parable is going. God had given his goods to the Jews and instead of using those goods for the benefit of others, what were they doing? They were squandering those, those, those gifts. And so, by the way, this is Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And so, when, when this happens, the, the rich man, the Lord in this parable, commends the steward for thinking quick thinking about his future. This is what the parable is pointing to. God, Jesus is speaking to his people saying, listen, the Gentiles are about to become the stewards. Do what's right. That's what he's telling the Jews. Do what is right. Secure for yourself eternal life because what I've given you, you've squandered. And so in this sense, it's, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, listen, when I've given you goods, look at what the, look at what the corrupt people do. Mm -hmm. They think about their future. Okay, how am I going to, if I'm in danger of losing this, what can I do to still get in? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening in this parable. Jesus is saying, don't waste the goods that I've gifted you with on yourself. Pour them out into others. So that when I come again, you're gonna, you will enter into, into eternal life. And we see this in Matthew 25 when Jesus comes and he says uh, to, to those on his right hand, come enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because you did this, this, this. When did we see you and do this? Mm -hmm. Oh, they were spending their goods, right? Mm -hmm. They were spending the gifts that God had given them on the less fortunate. Mm -hmm. And so that's the parallel uh, in this parable that we're looking at is uh, how do we secure our future by helping those in need? Amen. All right. Amen. Okay. I have a mental health question here. Uh, it says, I've been hearing a lot about the vag vagus nerve, vagus nerve um, and how it, let me get my glasses, how it relates to trauma. Is this a, a real thing? And, and are the, is the vagus nerve exercises actually helpful? So very good question. And the answer to that is yes. And for those who are not uh, familiar with what uh, the vagus nerve is, it is the longest uh, nerve um, in the nervous uh, system, okay? And so when that is activated, when it's activated, um, I've heard therapists, and I like to share it like this way, this way too, say it's like giving the central nervous system mm. a hug. And what it does is it, is it um, activates uh, the uh, parasympathetic, yeah, sorry, not saying that right, parasympathetic uh, nervous system. It activates that. And that is 
our homeostasis. Like that's like our peaceful, uh, just calm. When that when that area is regulated or is just activated, mm-hmm. we're just in this peaceful state. That's where we're. That's where we're supposed to be, unless we're in a danger in a danger situation, right? Then the other. Uh, sympathetic nervous system is activated to let us know like, okay, you're in danger, activate, you got to do something. Um, And um, that's where, when we're anxious, not the parasympathetic is activated, but the sympathetic area is activated. And unfortunately, and that's a good thing, God gave us that. So when we're, I heard a a therapist talk about it like this, when we're being chased by a bear, that area needs to be activated so we know to run or Mm -hmm. do whatever we have to do. But when we're talking about when we're anxious, that area is activated as well, and there's no bear chasing you. Mm -hmm. So that's not a good thing. So you want to be able to bring yourself back into the parasympathetic state because that's where we should be. That is, this is a whole sermon just blew up in my head right now, so (laughs) this might take a little minute. That space, that homeostasis, that space, and that parasympathetic space, that is where we are trusting God. You can't be trusting God and be experiencing intense anxiety at the same time. That that trust in God doesn't doesn't coexist in that space. It's in the parasympathetic space. Okay, back to the vagus nerve. So you're like, well, how do I activate this vagus nerve? It is a real thing. There are several different ways that we can do that. You've heard me talk about breathing. So the breathing, the four, six, four, sorry, four, seven, nine, the deep breath from the abdomen, hold it for six or seven counts and then release. Do that like... Do that one time and you've activated it, but do that three times, you're definitely going to be in a relaxed state. People Mm -hmm. think that's so simple and like, oh, just breathing. No, 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 no. You're activating that nerve. And so, and again, that's the the longest nerve in that system to be able to bring you back into that parasympathetic area. Um, And so the breathing, and believe it or not, there is an area behind your ear where if it's massaged, you can massage this area. I guess I'm doing it now, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It activates that nerve. If you don't believe me, like this is a little bottle of essential oil and it says parasympathetic on it because it's activating that area. I've had this in my purse. I use this before I do public speaking or any time that I feel like, okay, I might need a little extra, I do my breathing too, but I activate that. Yes, it does work. It, 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 it brings you down. I even, somebody saw me put it, do this, and they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm just uh, putting myself in the right state so I can be able to do this public speaking thing. And what happens when you do that, when that's all relaxed mm-hmm. and you're in that space, the, your prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking part of our brain, you can think and you can say the things you want to say. And when you're doing public speaking, you're not the anxiety is not shutting everything yeah. down on you. Or you're, um, when you're, I tell my students that you know when you're taking, I have them do the breathing, and they don't have this. It's not really the oil; it's the massaging, right? Right. right. And um, so any essential oil are just mas- massaging this part at the back of your ear. And then there's not a specific. I've heard people say, "Is there a specific spot?" There's not. Just massage back here. I tell them to do that because it opens up this part, the thinking part of their brain, so they can remember the answers on the test that they studied for. I could do this whole Sabbath school on this, so we're just going to leave it there. <laughs> but yes, there was that. The other things. Um, I just want to go over this really quick. Is um, so the deep breathing, the massaging behind the, on the ear, exercise. We all know the importance of daily cardio exercise that also can bring you in that space. Here, an example is meditation. I would say prayer, right? But just med- but even meditation. I mean, mm-hmm. we can just prayer slash meditation because you're meditating on the words of God, mm-hmm. the promises of God that also brings you into that uh, state and you're not... Now, you don't want to be in that state where you think you're being chased by a bear and claiming God's promises because you can't really do that. You can't coexist there. So you could be doing that in your meditation. Um, Music, uh, listening to calm music, soothing music can also put you or activate that nerve. Um, And believe it or not, um, pre, pre, um, um, let's see. 
yeah, probiotics and prebiotics can also put you in that state as well. Um, because this is what we eat in our gut, um, 95% of our serotonin and stuff is produced there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's other, so the, the brain gut connection is very close. So when you want to activate that nerve and to be in that space, that homeostasis space that we're supposed to be in, that God wants us to be in, unless we're being chased by a bear, then those are all some of the ways that you can activate that nerve. Mm. And you can do research on it as well. Because I didn't do it quite justice, but I tried to answer that question. Yeah. Tried to answer the question. All right. I think you did good. Thank you. Hudson. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think uh, we. I'm gonna go to. <sighs> I got two questions. One about the 144,000. The other one about the daily sacrifice in Daniel chapter 12. So I think I think I'm gonna do the 144,000 first, uh, and then. Then I'll, then I'll pass it back to you. Okay. All right. So uh, the 144,000, is that number literal or is it symbolic? So there are uh, different views uh, on, on this subject. Um, there are people that believe the number is literal. There are people that believe the number is symbolic. Um, I at one time believed that the number was literal. I now believe the number is symbolic. Let's clarify and that real quick. <laughs> clarify. You believed it was literal for a very short amount of time. I, I believe it was literal for, I, I think, a long time. No. <laughs> Maybe like our Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, yeah. you're right. But I, it was at least years. It was at least yeah, years. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, but yeah. it may be three or four yeah. years. Yeah. Comparatively speaking, he's been yes. he's known Jesus for thirty, so we'll say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've known Jesus for thirty, mm -hmm. okay. probably about five years, I say. So, so I one time did believe it was literal. Uh, now I believe it is symbolic, and um, I I I came to that conclusion um, again by studying the Bible um, and looking at. Comparing all the verses that talk about the 144,000. Um, and when you look at these verses, you will, you will, count it, when you study this out, I believe, um, you will come to understand that the 144,000 and the great multitude are really one and the same group. Um, when we, when John in Revelation chapter 7, and this is the thing that first, when I heard this, I was like, wow, that makes sense. When John in Revelation chapter 7 hears the, the number, it's important to note that he hears it. He doesn't see 144,000. The Bible says, and I heard the number of them that were sealed, and it says 144,000. <clears> Yeah, Deborah, I'm going to come to that in a second as well. John then says, after he hears the number, he then says, and I turned to look. I turned to behold. And when he turns, what does he see? A great multitude which no man could number. The reason why I believe it is so crucial to understand the importance of this number is because what I have found is that when I believed it was literal, everybody became suspect to me. Because of only 144,000 people in, you know, within Adventism are going to remain at whatever point, it was like, okay, well, what am I doing that is different from to... everybody else mm -hmm. that is going to set me aside to be one of the 144,000 because I need to be one of those 144,000 and whatever I can do to beat you out of being in that number, I'm going to do. So I'm going to be... You saw me roll my eyes. As a yeah, mental yeah. health professional, this doctrine is so 
mentally damaging. Because now... And has destroyed so many people's relationship with God. Yeah. So, so now it becomes easy for me to judge other people. It becomes easy for me uh, to put crazy things in the comment section. <laughs> it becomes easy to, for easy for me crazy things. to think, think crazy things. Judgmental. It becomes easy for me to condemn, and it becomes easy for me to isolate, right? To to it's yeah, Terry. It becomes this spirit of competition, in which the more I can see what's wrong with everybody out there, is the more I'm affirming that I must be one of the 144,000. I keep rolling my eyes because I'm sorry, guys. This is like a this this false teaching or understanding bothers me so much. Yeah. Because it's really it's destroyed, like I said, people's relationship with God, and they have just left God altogether. Which, to be honest, if I really believed and thought that way, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be in a church either, or I wouldn't believe because. First of all, and guys, I say it all the time: when in doubt, always go back to the character of God. So, if we have the right filter for the character of God or understanding of the character of God, you're not going to believe that. Because how, that's not mercy. That's not kind and loving like 144,000 out of, okay, let's just say out of Adventism. We, what, is there 22 million, mm -hmm. they say? 22 mm -hmm. million. Mm -hmm. And only 144, what? Like, what's the point? Like, you're at, like, what's the point of doing all of this if yeah. that's was going to be the reality. Yeah. So that makes you think, okay, like, oh, I don't have this understanding correct. Let and, me go and back so, and study yeah. some more. And basically what you've just assumed is that all, almost the entire church is, is, is lost. Basically. So what's the point of anything? Yeah. So think about this. There are 19,000, I just Googled it, 19,000 cities in, um, in America alone. <clears throat> um, think about this. If you were, to, if, if, think about the population of our world. How would it be a great multitude if only 144,000 people are redeemed from the earth? And by the way, the Bible literally says when, it, when John asks, who are these 144,000? And the answer comes back, these are they that were redeemed from the earth. So now you got to ask yourselves a question. Is John actually saying that, the 140, that there are only 144,000 people redeemed from the earth? Now, by the way, this is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Yes, it is. They believe that only 144,000 people are going to heaven because the text clearly says mm -hmm. these are they which were redeemed from the 144,000. Now, I got to mention some inside Adventist talk here because here's what happened with me. When I was reading about the 144,000 in the writings of Ellen White, mm -hmm. I was putting that, I was like, okay, boom. Mm -hmm. Well, Ellen White is saying that it's literal, which she actually never said this number is literal. Mm -hmm. But my interpretation of it was, oh, this is literal. Then I go to the Bible and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is the first, that this subject is the first subject that caused me to realize how important it is to do what Ellen White actually said, which is prove your position from the Bible yes. and then go. And when I did that and then went back to the, to, to the writings of Ellen White and was like, wait a minute, she's using verses that apply to the great multitude and applying them to the 144,000 mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. using verses that applied to the 144,000 and applying it to the great multitude, I was like, I never saw this before. Wait, what? Mm -hmm. I remember when that study just blew up for you. Right? So it becomes crucial then for us to understand. And what this teaching does, let me say it again, especially in the so-called present truth circles, mm. especially within conservative Adventism, is we develop this crab like mentality. Mercy. How many of y'all remember? We could just park it right here yeah. and spend the rest of Sabbath school talking about this, but go ahead. Yeah. You develop this crab like mentality where 
if you're not one of the 144,000 and there's 22,000, like yeah, you need to do everything you can to save yourself, mm -hmm. to get on that ship that only holds 144,000 people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what it does to a person's psyche, what it does to that, or you're saying the high, the, the, <laughs> the you, 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 the you actually, yeah, you're actually living out your yeah. Christian experience your in absolute Christian. stress. Mm -hmm. And anxiety. In absolute stress and anxiety. And I didn't know that question was coming, but it all ties into yeah. this, the t-shirt, the yeah. t-shirt message today. So if, it's, watch this, okay. if, if it's 144,000 and you're one of those, what are the odds that anybody else in your family, what are the odds that anybody else in your family is part of that 144,000? Guys, guys. So oh. now everybody's lost and yes. you begin to have this attitude of superiority. And you're low key depressed, but you're not just, you're not, you're spiritually yeah. depressed, but you're not saying it because you so desperately still want to be saved. But you'd have to be so, you'd have to be depressed because it, the odds would be maybe you're saved, I'm not, none of our kids, our parents, like, what? Like, what would yeah. heaven, what, what does that look like to be excited to go to heaven and the chances or the odds, if you believe that that's literal, that the family that you love would actually be there? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's a whole lot. There's a whole study in and of itself. Because I know some of you might be listening out. But it is something that needs to be talked yeah. about. And you're like, well, what about where, you know, this? Or what about those that are alive? Uh, Aren't the 144,000 those that are alive and translated at the coming of Christ? And what we need to understand, beloved, is that the 144,000 is literally another, it's a symbol for the redeemed. It is a symbol for the saved. Something else that plays into this is the idea of two closes of probation. Yeah, and the true. idea of two closes of probation is this. The and hundred that false teaching of a remnant and a remnant. The, yeah, the That's whole remnant within the remnant, the whole two close of probation. So now the idea is, if there's going to be close of probation on the church first, that's going to yield 144,000, and then 144,000 are going to go out and get the great multitude. But here's a problem: only those that are sealed. There are only two groups of people at the end of time. Mm -hmm. Those that are sealed and those that are marked. So if the 144,000 go out and get a great multitude, don't the great multitude get sealed too? So if the great multitude gets sealed too, but only the 144,000 are sealed, that is a big signal. That is a huge signal that the 144,000 and the great multitude, which all must be sealed, are the same number. It's not 144,000 special Adventists that are going to go out and get the great multitude. No, the 144,000 is the sum, is the symbolic number. Please note, it's not 144,001 or 143,999. It's 144,000. It is a symbolic number. And remember how we were talking about the... the uh, yes, Donna, I'm, I'm, you're answering her, Donna's question right now. It's a symbolic number representing... The redeemed. Millions, millions of people. M absolutely. Mm -hmm. That are redeemed from the earth. Redeemed from, yeah. Remember how we said millions. that uh, the, if you parallel the seven churches, the seven seals, and the seven trumpets, mm -hmm. you'll see that they all tell the same story but from different perspectives? Right. The 144,000 has a parallel in the seven churches and in the seven, uh, in the seven trumpets. And when you look at the parallel, they, they all point to the idea that this is a symbolic number that represents all, ultimately, everyone that is redeemed from the earth. Mm -hmm. So once again, it is this idea of two closes of probation, the remnant within the remnant, the 144,000 being, being uh, uh, um, 
a literal number that lends itself to the very crab-like mentality that you find oftentimes within Adventism. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, do you remember the game Pac-Man? No. Y'all remember the game Pac-Man? We're not going to talk com competition right now, but I could beat you at a game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could beat you at a game of Pac-Man right now. Like, that was my childhood the game. The goal of Pac-Man. Me and my brother did that yeah. for hours. All right. It was to <laughs> chomp up everybody else. Yeah. Chomp up everybody else, and as you chomped up everybody else, you just got bigger and bigger and more powerful, right? You had to get little power things. Yeah, you had to get in, in the corners. They gave you like power yeah. things. Yeah, that... and that's kind of what we see happening with with a lot of people who hold this. It's Pac-Man. It's who else can I chew up? Who else can I say? Yeah, you're not it. You're not it. Because you're then not when it, you chew up it. all the things, you're you lost. are the, the 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 you're the you're yeah. the low, you're the low, you, yep. you've won. Yep. You're the best. You're the best. And uh, God just didn't. you you are the one that has not bowed the knee Ugh. to Baal, and everyone else is just off and wrong and this and that. And you have to have this mentality because if you don't, how are you gonna how are you gonna be one of the hundred and forty four thousand? I have so much yeah. to say. So. But can I say this one thing? Like I didn't mean for this to go this long on the no, 144,000. No, but I'm glad you did. No, I'm glad you yeah. did because it needs to be. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of confusion. And in the chat, you can see a lot of people are just kind of realizing, mm -hmm. understanding. I mean, not everyone, but some for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, there is so... The work that God wants to do in our hearts to really deal with our you know, sin issue from a loving God, right? That is... That is a, a work of a lifetime, and it takes all of that um, time to be, you know, just to really be in a, in a very close, connected relationship with God that we don't have time. We shouldn't have the time or energy to look at anybody else <laughs> and judge anybody else and think we can tell anybody else anything about anything about. Um, their lifestyle or their, you know, Christianity or whatever. We need to focus on our relationship with God and who we are. Because we step out of that to do that, to be rebuking everybody and telling everybody they're doing this wrong and that wrong. And, and it takes time away from what God is trying to do in your life. Yeah. And so it is not what God has called us to do. He's yeah. called us to spread the gospel, and the, and the gospel is not all of these reforms that uh, the Christian Adventist um, conservatives like to talk about all the time. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ and his love for us. That's all he's called us to do. He has not called us to go around rebuking everyone. Um, and then we do all of that, and we don't share the gospel. Mm -hmm. I like to say the next time somebody, I was like, speak for myself, rebukes me, I'm gonna be like, so, so how many souls have you won? Let's just say this year. Let's just, okay, we won't say today or this yeah. month or in the last five years. How many souls have you won? But you have all this time and energy to do that. So I'm gonna jump back to something real quick. And I just was relating that to the yeah, crab. Yeah, thing, so. absolutely. It's, it's crab Adventism. Mm -hmm. um, so someone asked, well, what about, you know, only the redeemed can learn this song. Uh, if, you, if you look at that statement carefully, um, only the 144,000 can sing this song. You know, if we go into, into, into spirit of prophecy, right? Um, in the spirit of prophecy, uh, in that account, we're told that angels cannot sing that song from experience because they have not been through that experience. Right? So those who sing the song are those who have gone through the experience, which means this is humanity that's singing the song. Mm -hmm. Angels are singing along, but they're not singing it from experience, the song of Moses. By the way, mm -hmm. when you look at the song of Moses, who is it that sang the song of Moses? Everybody that was delivered out, out of, of Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. And that was... Jews and Egyptians. Right. Yeah, and Egyptians, yes. There was a mixed multitude, multitude 
that crossed okay. over to the other side, and it is that mixed multitude that sang the song. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna read a verse to you, Isaiah 51 verse and those 11. Those who are saved, all the everyone who passes saved. over, right. Is gonna sing that song. They're singing that song from an experience, and That's the angels right. can't sing it because they right. didn't have that experience. Because they don't have the experience of humanity. No. Listen to Isaiah 51, verse 11. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Isaiah 51 literally says that it is the redeemed of the Lord that will sing on Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. So who is that? Is that just 144,000 people? No, the redeemed is a great multitude which no man could number. And this is why, this is why, huh. so, stay yeah. Stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. Yeah, so, so focused. this is why Again, uh, Lord, Lord, have mercy and, and, and help Thanks, me. Folks. Yeah. So this is why it's interesting that that. Because you're actually addressing that. Yeah, I'm here. addressing this. Yeah. This is the this is the reason, right? So now. we disagree about something that is doctrinal, mm -hmm. and okay, well, I'm gonna blast you because you disagree with this thing doctrinally, and I'm gonna say this and say that. And here's the funny thing, like, many of these people, it's so funny, like, if they, if, this is not a, you know, if they were to be in front of you face to face, they would never do it. They would never, do it. They yeah. would never say the things, oh, <laughs> hey, brother. No, no, but you've, and but you've experienced that. There's, I've experienced there's it. Key, there's key, what they call them in. keyboard warriors, yeah. um, and even those who write articles, things like that. Um, and then when they see you, it's like, when it's oh, in person, oh, brother. And I don't know if it's because they're like, well, you know, he goes to the gym or whatever. I'm not going <laughs> to hit anybody. Like, no, that's not going to happen. You know what? But it is that kind of no, a, he's not gonna is that. that kind of a spirit that we begin to, it, we begin to, to be like, okay, it's okay for me to just, you see what I'm saying? Do this and say this and, and act this way because I'm doing it in the name of of yeah. truth. It's not because you go to the gym. I've never had anyone be as rude to my face as they are online. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, I do go to the gym, but I don't look But like we him. do that. But, but we, we do that. Like mm -hmm. we, we, our, our keyboards. And it shows the condition of our hearts. Yes. And, and many in our church, our keyboard and screens are like yeah. our uh, protection yeah. or they give us a false sense, sense of, of confidence, yeah. which you really need to pray about and take that back to, yeah. you need to put that in your prayer closet because it's really, yeah. it's, a, it's a salvation thing. Yeah, and this is the problem, right? This is the reason why this kind of mentality, a lot, it, it leads us to the condemnation that we see so often, right? It leads us to the personal, right? You're unsaved, you're lost, you're, you're this, you're that, you're a hypocrite, you're this. Mm -hmm. It leads to all that. And so this verse I just read, Isaiah 51, 11, mm -hmm. the redeemed of the Lord, the redeemed of the Lord are going to sing on Mount Zion. Meaning everybody who put the blood on the pulse of their doors and thus were able to escape Egypt and get into the promised land, every one of them sang the song of Moses. When we understand this and look at its parallel at the end of time, everyone that crosses over from this Egypt into the heavenly Canaan, they are going to sing the song of Moses because everyone will have the experience, the joy of having left this world to cross over into the heavenly Canaan. When we misunderstand this point, when we misunderstand this thing, mm -hmm. and that's why people don't realize, like, the importance of rightly understanding truth, it actually affects the way we end up living our Christian lives. Mm -hmm. It actually affects the way that we end up living out Christianity. 
And this is why the devil is so interested in getting us off doctrinally. Mm -hmm. Because if he could do that, it's going to affect our walk all together with Jesus. So, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to do all this. The 144,000 was just supposed to be is it literal or symbolic, but it yeah. kind of just went off into, but, we, we but, may just do a whole. But it, but it, but it, because when it is misunderstood, yeah. it becomes the, and it's, it's funny that I just, well, you know, I've been having a lot of thoughts and thinking hold, hold about your thought, a lot hold of your things. Thought. We both have so much to say. I know. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. My sermon today is about the shaking. Yes. And this is crucial, you guys. Let me say this, and I don't want to give too much of my sermon away. Yeah. But there are people who may consent to the truth and will be lost because of their lack of love for people. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. This is a serious, serious it's thing. And most people don't understand most people will be shocked at who is shaken out of the church and who remains. That's it, all I'm going to say. No, no, no. It's, Make sure right. y'all tune it's in. It's so true and so fundamental. Like, if you don't have even, even you know, when, put it this way, Jesus does not like or whatever Satan, what Satan is doing or has done to us and what he does, mm -hmm. you know, to his people in this world, right? But you can't see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus is like, you know, I hate him or, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to tell, you know, I'm going to give you guys everything you need to be able to defeat him, but I'm not, God's not like going out of his way to be, mean to Satan, even destroying him in hellfire forever is not mean. It's really like, you can't be in heaven. Right. Uh, you're not going to be here and messing with my, my other kids either, but mm -hmm. you will be miserable as well. And so I have, you have to be destroyed. Yeah. So my point is that is the fundamental characteristic of God is love and love for others. When we're doing all of this, you know, we disagree about a theological thing or you know, something the church has done or whatever, and I'm going to come for you and I'm going to come for you and I'm going to camp out and I'm going to uh, act like basically what I see on the news every day in these political parties mm -hmm. um, attacking each other and that same spirit. Let me just use the January 6th spirit. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to start calling mm -hmm. it. I, it's a January 6th spirit. That's what I see happening right now. Yeah. Um, it, it's like that you're so far from or you're so distant and so far from the character of God. And the scary thing is you don't realize it. Yeah. The scary thing is you think you're doing God a service. Holding Jesus signs. That is a scary, scary place yeah. to be. Yeah. And all you can really do is pray. Yeah. Pray for the spirit of someone or a group of people who feel led by that spirit. Let's put it this way. The same spirit that led January 6th is the same spirit that I, I see and some of these groups that are doing yeah. this in the church, in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Our January 6th is coming. I know that's a scary thing to, to say and to think. But it's, but the our spirit January is, is here, is coming. unfortunate. Mm -hmm, the spirit mm -hmm. is here. Yeah. So, all right. Again, again. Um, I'm not, we're not, obviously not doing any more questions. No, but I do want to do a part two to our question and answer because we had good questions and I still had good mental health questions. We do need to and do a so part two. we're going to do a part two to the questions that we have. Yeah. Um, and, and put up one in the chat if you would like to see a full study on the 144,000. Okay. A full study on the 144,000. January 6th, uh, Falcon 1 is what happened on the Capitol January 6th, three or four years ago. I'm putting a one. My, I have a yeah. one. I want to go deeper into this. Yeah. And just because I just want to say again, I really truly think that this, because I was thinking about it, like I was like, where did this type of foundation and faulty thinking come from that we have to tear others down or it's a competitive spirit or I got to make myself seem better? And I believe it came from that. And even if people move over partially into thinking like, oh, 144,000 is not literal, they still have a hard time shaking that spirit off of them. Yeah. And that goes on, and you know, generationally, as you know, we you know 
our, teach um, even our children and family about, mm -hmm. about Jesus. If we mm -hmm. haven't shaken that spirit completely off, we'll still bring that, bring that in. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the simple shift, we, we they, yes, David, I'm sorry. So let's do this. I'm going to answer the daily, and that'll be my last question. Okay. Um, uh, so, okay. Let's go ahead and uh, um, let me deal with this daily question, and then, then we'll, we'll end it here. So the daily. Um, you know what? <sighs> That's going to take... Let, let me say it this way. It I'll try to do this simply. Does it take longer than five minutes? The daily is basically, uh, the, 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 the word is tamid. When the Bible talks about the daily being taken away by the little horn, um, some people think that the daily represents paganism. Others think that the daily um, points to the sanctuary. In both cases, the little horn takes away paganism as well as takes away the, the, the sanctuary. I believe um, that the... I believe that the, uh, the daily being taken away points very specifically to the heavenly sanctuary being cast down. The word daily, tamid, is used continually. The word literally means continually. It is used continually to represent the different aspects of the sanctuary, not just the, the, the sacrifice. And so when you see some people say, oh, the, the word sacrifice in Daniel chapter 8, the daily sacrifices shall be taken away. And the word sacrifice is italicized, meaning it's not in the original text. So some people think, oh, this is the taking away of, you know, the sacrificial system um, in the Old Testament. No, it's talking about the entire sanctuary service. And when the papacy began to replace all the things the sanctuary represented, um, baptism, the word of God, uh, the, 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 the intercession of Christ, all of these things were taken away. That's what Daniel chapter 7 is pointing to. The place of his sanctuary being cast down, meaning the heavenly sanctuary being removed and a counterfeit system set up in its place. But in order to do that, paganism also had to be removed. So both are true. Paganism was taken out of the, was, was removed, but also the heavenly sanctuary was, was symbolically cast down. So in a sense, it is pointing to the papacy doing both of these things. But I believe more specifically, it's pointing to the, the, the heavenly sanctuary being removed and, uh, or the truth of the sanctuary being removed and a counterfeit set up in its place. Mm -hmm. That is my super short version for that question. Yes. All right. Yes. We definitely still had good questions uh, left. So we're going to do them. Uh, we're going to answer those questions in our next question and answer. So you got to always stay tuned to Living Man in Church and see if your uh, question is going to be um, answered. All of them that come in will be answered, just maybe couldn't fit them all into one program. So definitely stay tuned for that. Uh, we okay. One second. David, speaking specifically of Daniel 8.13, I believe that's where it is specifically, that's the strongest argument for the past, for the, um, for the, um, the um, Tamid pointing to the temple in heaven versus paganism, okay? That is what was taken away by the little horn. That is what was cast down in the context is the sanctuary being cast down, okay? All right, so I'll stop there. Okay, all right. And Sally, yes, <laughs> the daily is a need for us to continue in that, you know, accepting Christ mm -hmm. daily, daily and being born again daily, daily. and our daily bread, yes. getting our daily bread and praying daily and letting our light shine daily, daily. Uh, and, and, and having the law of God written upon our hearts daily, rewritten upon our hearts daily. So you have a whole the, sermon. Yeah, I did a whole sermon on this. It's called the daily. It's called or the daily. No, the, uh, the, the Tamid. The Tamid. The yes, tamid. tamid. And the devil is still trying to take away the Tamid. tamid. Yes, I remember. 
Don't study daily. Mm -hmm. Don't accept Christ. Right? This is what Satan is still attempting to do to this day. We, we ought to be Christians daily, daily. not weekly, not mm -hmm. monthly, not yearly, mm -hmm. but daily. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's, he's trying to take away the Tamid, the continual. Okay. Amen, David. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being here for our first service. Um, we are going to, we're going to close this out. And we have a second reading of a member transfer. So we're going to do that and let you know how you can become a member of Living Mana Church if you would like to. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time to, uh, to, to do the question and answer session. I pray that uh, our answers, Lord, um, will, will be a blessing to those that are watching and those that will watch, Lord. And uh, again, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to exercise daily godliness, Lord. Amen. Lord, please save us from, this, from the crab-like spirit, the yeah. Pac-Man spirit, Lord, uh, where, we, where we need to devour others in order to, to uh, puff ourselves up, Lord. And Lord, just help me to prepare for that Pac-Man sermon because it's coming. Uh, it's coming. So Lord, please give me the insight and uh, may these words... Uh, resonate and may, may all the Pac-Mans in our church uh, cease to do what they are doing is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.